Hi, this is Karen Launchball. I'm at the University of Idaho. I live over here in the West, but I grew up in the Great Plains. Grew up in North Dakota, and I'm going to show you some of the really beautiful Great Plains grasslands and try to help you uh, think about the short grass prairie, the mixed prairie, and the tall grass prairie, and some of the important plants and climates of those ecosystems today. Okay, let's start with the big picture. Here is the map of rangelands of the world, actually just of North America, I've clipped out. And you can see right in the middle of North America is this big mass of golden area, and that is the Great Plains, and that's all grasslands. And we'll talk about why that's grasslands, but from the shadow of the Rocky Mountains all the way to the real music sites out in the Midwest, that's all this beautiful mass of prairies or grasslands and just waving grasses. So let's take a look at what's in that golden mass. Here's a little closer look at that region of grasslands that is in the central Great Plains of North America. This map is by Kukler. Kukler was a German-born geographer, and he had a real fascination with where plant communities were in North America. He lived actually almost the whole um, 1900s. He was born in 1907 and he died in 1999. So he spanned that whole 1900s. And during that time, he walked and drove and and flew over the no North America and kept working on classifying the vegetation that covered North America. So, so this is a map that we use a lot. This is actually a very simplified map. We've condensed a lot of his real detailed work into some major categories. But this is what you would often hear about this Kukler vegetation map. So here is where we're going to start. Now, if you look in the Great Plains, you see three or four regions of green. Those are those prairies. Um, in the west here is in that lime, light green is the short grass prairie. And then it molds into the mixed prairie and Kukler divided into the northern and southern mixed regions and then the really dark green color is the tall grass prairie with most of this just the traditional tall grass prairie in the midwest and then a special group of tall grass prairie in the middle of Nebraska known as the sand hills and the sand hills are beautiful I'll show you some pictures of those so what we're talking about today then is all of these grasslands that make up the middle of the of the North American continent, and those are called the Great Plains grasslands. As we start to think about where that um, tall grass, mixed grass, and short grass exist on the globe, it's important to think about precipitation because the tall grass is tall because it has a lot of precipitation. So on this map, you see that green area and the darker green that is kind of around Ohio, oh, I'm sorry, Ohio, uh, Illinois, Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas. That's kind of the core of the tall grass prairie. And it's got quite a bit of precipitation in that range of like 30 some inches of precipitation a year, which also made it very good for farming. We'll talk about that later. As you get into that white yellow area going to the west in the uh, middle of the continent, uh, precipitation gets less and less, and that's where that mixed prairie is in the kind of that golden region. So that all the way down those pl those plain states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, uh, o Oklahoma, and Kansas, all of those states um, have sort of that mid range of precip, and they have mixed prairie right up against the Rocky Mountains in uh, Montana, Colorado. In, and then eastern uh, uh, Wyoming and eastern Colorado, you start to see short grass prairie. And that's because the precipitation is pretty pretty low. It's uh, say five to 10 or five to 15 inches of precip a year. So those darker colors, that darker orange uh, along that side of, of the map, um, right on the other side of the Rockies, on the east side of the Rockies, that's where we see short grass prairie. These climates uh, follow a pattern that we roughly group into a climate region of the Great Plains. And what's really unique or significant about Great Plains climates is that the amount of precipitation, the, year, the months that have the greatest precipitation have the greatest temperature. So in these climatographs on the right-hand side, um, I've just taken three spots, one in Minnesota, one in Minas in Nebraska, and then down to Texas, to Lubbock, Texas. And you'll see in all of these graphs, there's a peak of, of temperature in the summer. That's no surprise. But there's also a peak of uh, precipitation in the summer. That's not going to be the same when we get over west to the Great Basin or the Mediterranean. But right here in the Great Plains, we see a time where there's a lot of precipitation at the same time as there's high temperatures. If you look down those from the top to the bottom of those graphs, 
you'll see that as you go further south, you start to see the more pre predominant spring fall rain. Like in Lubbock, they have a real peak of rain in the summer, pretty dry summers, and then peak of rain in the fall. But the, the basic pattern exists on all of those Great Plains climate, high precipitation at a time of high temperature. And if you've ever visited the Great Plains, it's, it's really cool because that's what gives rise to those big rolling thunderstorms that just roll across the plains. And you can sit on your front porch and just watch them come to you because the, the, at that point of high temperature, there's a lot of convective energy that's going into the atmosphere. And it's creating those big, um, nim those big nimbus clouds that are just really creating thunderstorms. They're creating lightning, and they're moving across and laying a lot of precipitation onto the ground. And also because there's lightning, they're creating opportunities for fire. So we'll talk later about fire. When you combine the effects of climate and vegetation, you have this um, resulting factor of soils, of course. Soils is time and is, is uh, vegetation and is climate. And these, this is a map of the soil orders of North America, of the United States, actually. And what you see, if you kind of remember where those Great Plains grasslands are, they're in that area that's green right down the middle of the continent. They, uh, that green soil is mollusols. Grasslands create these beautiful mollusol soils with rich horizons of organic matter. Again, very good for farming. There's one spot, you'll see that kind of blue spot in the middle of Nebraska. Those are entosols. Entosols are not very um, highly developed soils. They don't have strong horizons. And the Nebraska Sandhills is a beautiful grassland, really beautiful grassland. And it's made of these sandy soils that are entosols. So the other thing that's characteristic of a lot of the grassland soils would be entosols. As you move right up against the Rocky Mountains, you start to pick up a little bit of a mix. You have some mollusols, some entosols. You also have some aridosols. Aridosols are arid soils. They're the ones that are pretty dry. We'll talk a lot more about aerosols, or I'm sorry, aridosols when we get on the other side of the Rockies to the real drier climates. A way that, that um, scientists have combined this concept of vegetation and geology and climate is in ecoregions. So the concept of ecoregions tries to combine both vegetation and climate and geography, or all three of those factors. And you see, um, for us, when we're talking about the Great Plains grasslands, it's, it's really clear. The Great Plains are just all right down the center. They have similar geology, they have similar climate, and they have similar soils as, as a respect for that that give rise to similar vegetation. So that's what we're going to talk about, that Great Plains ecoregion. Start with the tall grass prairie. The tall grass prairie is that really moist, mesic region out on the east side, and then we'll move west. Well, let's start with the tall grass prairie. Mesic, of course, means moist, and that's a grassland that has rainfall right during the middle of the growing season. Just those two things just combine. Uh, one thing that's really important to remember about the tall grass prairie is fire is really important to maintain these healthy prairies and that the soil can be very deep and therefore it was really good uh, for farming and it was easily plowed so there's very little of this beautiful tall grass prairie ecosystem left and so we'll um the, i'm going to suggest some videos at the end of this lecture that you might really explore that tall grass prairie and how important fire is and although we have very little left maybe five percent of what was initially there it's really important for us to understand that tall grass prairie ecosystem Here's a few pictures of that ecosystem. You'll see that, of course, the tall grass. I've got some pictures here that when you're standing on the ground, the grass is above your, your eyes. And then, of course, fire is important. This ecosystem also has a lot of forbs and flowering plants. So here's a few details. When I talk about the prairie being moist or um, with a lot of precipitation, I'm talking like 20 to 30 inches per year or even 35 or almost up to 40 when you get to the eastern side of what was the tall grass prairie. And when you get to that high precipitation, shrubs really have an advantage. They can really take advantage of that, uh, that high precipitation. So in order to maintain the grasses, you have to have fire. Fire is really important to maintain these grasses. So a lot of prescribed fire is used to keep those shrubs at bay and, and keep this productive grassland ecosystem. These plants, these grasses in this ecosystem, they evolved with grazing and with fire. And so the majority of those plants are pretty well adapted to fire, especially later in the season. 
um, the this combination of climate and soils created uh, I mean, and, and vegetation created a really rich soil, the mala soils. The, that's those that dark, rich soil that we associate with the Great Plains. And of course, it was really great for plowing and for turning into croplands. So most of this land was converted to cropland. It's estimated that only about 5% of what originally existed exists today. If you ever get a chance to go to Kansas and look at the Kanza Prairie, there's several uh, pieces of the Kanza Prairie that are some of the largest remnants that exist today. It's, it's super, it's just beautiful. The plants that we'll study in this plant, the things that you really need to remember, those two tall grasses, when I say there's tall grasses, two of the really important ones that we'll study are our big blue stem Indian grass. We'll also study switchgrass, which is also a tall grass. And then this plant, this ecosystem is just full of beautiful prairie flowers like prairie coneflower. So those are three plants that we'll study later in the, in the class as part of this tall grass prairie. There's also a lot of really iconic animals that are part of the tall grass prairie. So don't forget about the bison and the deer and of course pheasants that are really known for just inundating this ecosystem. Okay, let's switch gears a little. Let's go a little further west. Let's keep heading towards the Rocky Mountains and we're going to get to the northern and southern mixed prairie. Now it's called the mixed prairie because it's a mix of stuff. It's a mix of tall and short grasses. It's a mix of cool season and warm season. It's a mix of grasses, forbs, and shrubs. It's also really patchy ecosystems across the uh, across the landscape. So this is a picture of the Badlands of North Dakota wh where I grew up and it's really um, in that mixed prairie. Some short grasses some tall grasses, all in the same ecosystem. Bison, of course, are very important, and you can see by these pictures that, that it really is just a mix of ecosystems uh, throughout, through, throughout that whole middle of the Great Plains. Some points to remember, the mixed prairie, as I mentioned, is a, a mix of uh, mixed of short and mid and tall grasses. It's a mix of cool and warm season. It's a mix of different plant communities. As far as precipitation on the landscape, this is in that, media, that moderate range, 14 to 20 inches or so of precipitation during the summer. Also, I didn't mention, but on the right-hand side, there's a picture of wetlands, and, and the middle of the continent was really important for migratory waterfall because there are many prairie potholes or playas, these shallow wetlands that are important for waterfall fowl. So many of the um, wildlife management areas that exist in the west are were created for waterfowl, so there's a lot of beautiful national wildlife refuges and wildlife management areas down this whole middle of the continent that is the mixed prairie. This area did evolve with heavy grazing by bison, so these plants are quite well adapted to grazing. And wildfire is historically very common, not maybe not quite as important as it was in the tall grass prairie, but it's certainly very common because they still have those rolling thunderstorms that come across the plains in the summer. Some of the important plants that we'll study that in the mixed prairie, we're going to study little blue stem. That's a mid grass. Uh, we'll study dotted gay feather, which is a fall, a warm season uh, forb that is very beautiful and really kind of an iconic uh, forb of the mixed prairie. Shrubby sinkfoil is one of those shrubs that we would find, um, especially on the north sides of hills in the mixed prairie. So again, a mix of grasses, forbs, and shrubs uh, here identified as little blue stem, uh, dotted gay feather, and shrubby sinkfoil. Animals that would be iconic and major in that ecosystem, of course, would be bison. Pronghorns start to appear more when you get in that mixed prairie because pronghorn are really designed to be in very open ecosystems. So we see them in the mixed and the short grass prairie. Red tail hawks and marsh hawks often seen on the prairie, hunting rodents, etc. And then another critter that is important. We don't often think about insects, but grasshoppers can really rage havoc on these native ecosystems and whether they um, are consuming vegetation that that would um, often want to be consumed by livestock or not they're just a native part of this ecosystem grasshoppers okay we're still moving west let's go to the driest part of the prairie and that's the short grass prairie it's the driest of the prairies of the great plains it's right in the rain shadow of the rocky mountains so that's a point to remember Here's some pictures of the of the short grass prairie. These are from very close to my home in northern part of the prairie. 
Um, but often that plateau region, and as you can see, the um, the grass is, is short. It's it's not a lot of diversity. It's really quite short. You can see forever. Uh, there's a great cowboy poet that said that range is where you can go further and see less than anywhere else in the world. And I think he was on one of these buttes when he wrote that. <laughs> Okay, so um, as far as the precipitation that we might see in this region, uh, we would we would have low uh, low rainfall, um, 12 to 20 inches. Uh, certainly, some areas it would have much less than 10 inches of year of rain a year in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains. So the Rocky on the east side of the Rockies, I'm sorry, on the west side of the Rockies, that's where you pick up all the precipitation. And then on the east side of the Rockies, there's a paucity of of precipitation. The native plants are well adapted to drought and uh, uh, heavy grazing. Uh, fire is not a major force. It does exist, but it's not a major thing because there's just not enough biomass to carry these really large fires. And uh, the signature grasses are blue grama and buffalo grass. So those are the two short grasses that are really signature grasses of the short grass prairie. So those plants again, blue grama, buffalo grass, they're both very short grasses. Remember buffalo grass is the one that has the um, the stolen, so it spreads over the top of the soil. Buffalo grass um, can really take in a, just even a light rain. It, because it, it spreads across the ecosystem, it can really take in that moisture. Uh, blue grama it can also spread out quite a lot. It's, it's not a sod grass, except that it can really expand and form one big mott of grass. We've talked about yellow, um, sorry, western yarrow before in the class, and it's a really widespread plant, but it's one that's really common in the short, short grass prairie. Some iconic animals of the prairie, of course, are the bison and the pronghorn that can see for miles, but also we start to pick up uh, prairie dogs and burrowing owls. That Those would be really common in that mixed and especially in the short grass prairie. I hope you enjoyed this little tour of the Great Plains and I hope you get to visit the Great Plains sometimes. It's, it's just beautiful if you want to see for miles and see the wind just blowing across the plains, this is the place to go.